Good evening, Stephen. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, good evening, Daniel. Um, so my name's Stephen Cocky. I'm a councillor for St. Lawrence, which is part of, uh, uh, which is a ward in Ventnor. So I'm on Ventnor Town Council. I'm also currently the deputy mayor of Ventnor, which is quite a privilege and provides a little bit of work for me as well. Um, so I've been on Ventnor Town Council since 2017. Um, I grew up in Ryde and then I moved away and I was actually off the island for around about 20 years. And uh, for 14 of those years, I was living in Europe. Uh, the whole time I was there, I was uh, developing more and more of an interest in local politics and community, society, the environment and these things as a whole. I returned to the UK at the beginning of 2017. And by chance or good fortune, there was an election just in March. And I, at that election, excuse me, in May, at that election, I stood for Ventnor Town Council and I stood for the, the County Council Division of Ventnor West. Mm -hmm. I came second in Ventnor West and uh, I managed to get a seat on Ventnor Town Council, which has been an excellent experience for me. I've learned a great deal in the last three years and there's still one, one year of the tenure left and uh, many more things to do. So living in different countries in Europe, uh, you probably got a different perspective on housing uh from you know the people who've lived on their island their whole lives so just tell us a little about um how um you saw housing working in europe okay i mean the first thing that strikes you is and i i kind of feel a little bit bad saying this um but the reality is there's there's a huge gulf in the quality of housing a really really huge gulf and not only that there's also a very large gulf in the price of housing mm. um what you can get in a french city in comparison with what you can get in a rural english town is quite dramatic um also mm, about half the time i lived in europe i was living in rental accommodation where you had very secure tenure um things were very orderly uh very large amounts of paperwork uh, in Switzerland, to the, it, it could be quite onerous renting an apartment to the point where, as you were moving out of the apartment, you would paint every wall in every room as you were departing, which seemed quite crazy at the time. Uh, so, you know, I mean, uh, a very large amount of work. But on reflection, you've come to learn that, that actually that reflects the extremely high quality of rental accommodation and the fact that every time somebody new is moving into uh, accommodation they basically they move into a new apartment right so so there are higher expectations of tenants but also of landlords presumably yes i mean i i'm i, I don't know the ins and outs of the tenancy agreements hmm. um however i know that in Germany and Switzerland, certainly, um, that uh, the rents could only be increased in line with inflation. And actually, when I remember now, when I, was when I was living in Switzerland, we actually received a rent decrease because, um, because interest rates had fallen. Right. And then that was okay. automatically passed on to the tenants, which right. was not really in coming, coming from the UK, absolutely not expected at all. And if I'm not mistaken, there was no possible way for the, the landlord to increase the rent over and above the what we started out as. There are loopholes. I mean, I know in Germany they've had a lot of trouble with uh, tenants being moved out of apartments temporarily and right. then the apartments being modernised. And as part of the modernisation, then the landlord is able to increase the rent. Mm. But as for ad hoc increases, I'm quite sure that the, the, these are simply not allowed. So it's far more common, isn't it, in European cities for uh, people of all types to rent rather than buy. Isn't that the case that you found? Uh, without question. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, the num rent renting in Germany is running around about 50 percent. Uh, right. I think it's I think it might even be higher in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, they it, it, they have a different culture there. They have a different approach to to housing, whereas in the UK, 
Um, I mean, this this feeds into so many different issues. But in the UK, housing is looked at more as your your nest egg, mm. and in Europe, it's looked at homes are looked at houses are looked at as homes, places right. places to live, mm. and. It's difficult to be precise, but the feeling is, is that in the UK, people do not have the feeling that the state is going to be able to look after them right. in later life. And to quite some degree, that's reflected in the very low levels of pensions that are paid in mm -hmm. the UK in comparison with our European neighbours. So people look to bricks and mortar as their nest egg. And right. then that leads on to a myriad of other problems as, as well of course. Mm. So presumably these European people, let's say um, they've got a job in another city, it's a really st relatively straightforward thing for them to, um, you know, give up their apartment in one town, uh, move to the city, um, start a new rental, something like that. So th there's flexibility presumably there for professional people, as well as uh, people seeking work of, of all kinds. Well, I think it would be incorrect for me to portray it as a very simple system and it would be incorrect to say that everything's working perfectly. Certainly when we moved within Lucerne, it was quite a struggle to find to find accommodation. Mm -hmm. We got there and we got there in the end and everything worked absolutely perfectly. We paid an arm and a leg, but everything worked absolutely perfectly. We didn't need to use the heating even when there was three foot of snow outside. And every time something went, went wrong, you click your fingers and it was fixed. Mm. Um, but, there, but housing pressure is, it, it is a global problem now. Mm. Um, certainly, I think it's more acute in the UK um, and certainly in uh, certain places like where I live in, in Ventnor, where it's the housing availability is incredibly poor on the rental market. So it would be, be wrong to paint too rosy a picture about Europe. But right. certainly there are protections in place and there, there are protections in place for the tenant, which I don't believe there are in this country. And certainly the, com the quality of accommodation is far, far higher. So you mentioned housing availability uh, where you live. Uh, what's the situation like in the rental market uh, in Ventnor? Uh, well, last time I looked actually on Rightmove and Rightmove does seem to be the official channel by which uh, mm. the rental market is assessed. It's even... Even local authorities use it now, which uh, shows that right. Rightmove obviously, have obviously captured the entire market there. Uh, but last time I looked on Rightmove, there was two properties for rent in Ventnor. And mm. this is a town of six and a half thousand people with two and a half thousand properties. So this right. is, right, let, let's do the maths quickly. This is 0 0.2, 0 0.1 of a percent right. is available in on, on the long-term rental market. Um, and one of those properties was twelve hundred pounds, and the other one was a bedsit. So, so that's per month, right? Twelve hundred pounds per month. Yes, that's twelve hundred pounds per month. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so that was particularly bad last time I checked. Um, however, I'd say in the last six months when I've been checking, it's never been above half a dozen properties. Right. And for one bedroom, two bedroom apartments, they're in. They can be. 700 pounds and upwards right and of course a, a two-bedroom apartment is the absolute minimum for uh for, for, for a family right so we've reached a point in ventnor where most people are simply excluded from from living in mm -hmm. the town to right. the point where i've actually seen adverts in the local supermarket with people offering cash rewards um mm -hmm. so desperate they are to, to find accommodation just for information leading to a rental. Yes, I can't remember the precise wording, right. but yes, presumably that the, the agreement would have had to have worked out for the £100 right. pounds to have been handed over. But yeah, I mean, th this one particular advert that comes to mind, uh, it was from a lady, mid-50s, mm -hmm. perfect references, no pets, yeah. non-smoker, quiet, you know, mm -hmm. the model tenant. Right. Um, but still, simply no availability. There's also some Facebook groups um, on the Isle of Wight which deal with private rentals. And um, if you glance down, you'll see literally dozens and dozens and dozens of posts of people looking for accommodation right. and nothing offered. Mm. Nothing. I mean, this, this must so, affect the local economy, right? Because if um, you've got someone who's looking to move to the town to start a new job or whatever, 
um, or trying to stay in the town that they already live in, that must have quite a strong knock-on effect on the, the local economy in terms um, of recruitment and so on. Well, I believe it, it, it will have increasingly. Mm. It's difficult to say at this point because, um, yeah, it's difficult. I don't think there's any metrics you know, that, that can tie in with that precisely. But it will have increasingly. Um, mm. What I believe is going to happen is as more and more people come to the end of their existing tenancies, then the landlords, once somebody mm. moves out, the landlords are not going to put those properties then onto the normal rental market. Then right. they will almost certainly go into the into the short term market because this is the the big problem that we have mm -hmm. here, in particular on this coast, is the sheer quantity of rental properties uh, for the short term holiday market. Right. Um, it's been estimated that there's in the region of three hundred properties, mm -hmm. so that would right. make up in excess in excess of ten percent of the. Of, of the of, of all the households here are, are now right. available uh, for short-term holiday let it's very hard to get a precise data because mm. so many properties are let upon multiple websites you can't go to one right. website and get get the complete picture right but anecdotally it's it's about 300 and added to that of course there's also second homes which yeah. is something that we have a particularly large problem with in the villages the villages of bond church and saint lawrence mm -hmm. anecdotally yep. again in bond church and be a, it could be up to 50 percent our second homes right where i live in saint lawrence i believe we're around 30 percent second homes and yep. increasing and then of course you'll have those properties that are uh, let under other arrangements so they may not be on a website like airbnb but they might be booked through an agency um, or, you know, there might be someone's a sort of long-term rental, um, but not um, for local people necessarily, you know, for um, they may have some sort of long-term arrangement to rent it to somebody for a weekend cottage or something like that, right? So I, I think you can tell in many of the island's villages that, uh, uh, you know, once the tourists go home in uh, sort of late September, um, you don't see them again until like the following Easter. And in the meantime, those towns and villages can be very, very quiet. Yes, I mean, certainly. Um, and, of course, the visitors that come bring a great deal of value to Ventnor. Mm. There's yeah. some really fantastic things in, in the town which are, which are wholly reliant on visitors. There's a, there's a superb restaurant scene which wouldn't mm. exist without them. Yeah. There's some fantastic small, uh, small shops that would not exist without the visitors. So we would always have to be careful to not start to exclude people who, mm -hmm. who wish to come yeah. here on holiday, of course. You know, the mm -hmm. town and the island as a whole has to welcome visitors with open arms. What's concerning is that when the, the, the collateral damage to society mm -hmm. as a whole becomes so widespread, then you cannot help but feel that the balance has been lost between, mm -hmm. between sustainable community and revenue. Yeah. And I suppose the difference in the last few years is some of these online platforms have uh, opened up these properties to a much wider market and uh, increased demand and therefore the income that landlords can obtain uh, from them. Yes. I, um, the cheapest properties in Ventnor for a one bedroom place, for example, would be around about 80, 90 pounds per night in season. Mm. So do the maths there. You're around about theoretically in one month you can make six months worth of rent right. had you put it onto onto the normal onto the normal market mm. so th there's actually a really strong economic disincentive to um rent out anything to somebody who's going to be around all year and i suppose you've also got that flexibility factor and that if people are only coming for a few days or at a time and they turn out to be a problem or not pay the rent or cause too much noise or whatever they'll soon be gone and so I think there's there's a sort of anxiety, isn't there, around uh, renting to people more long term in case they turn out to be not the best tenants. Yeah, that that could be a factor. I mean, un unfortunately, I've known lots of tenants and I've known lots of landlords, and <laughs> you know, yeah, there, there's there's bad stories from from both sides. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So, um, do you have any um, ideas about how we might begin to tackle this problem? Well, um, we. 
actually, w w all we need to do is actually look at, um, look to the hometown of Airbnb itself. That's San Francisco, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, where yeah, where there they actually have some of the toughest laws uh, against short-term letting in the world. Because I mean, San Francisco has been very famous for its uh, uh, for its uh, lack of accommodation. So they've really had to move on this subject. So in San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken, there's a 14% tax. Mm -hmm. You have to register every year, and your accommodation can only be let out for 30 days or 60 days um, right. per year. Um, so these laws like this could be introduced mm. or at least the powers could be introduced with flexibility and then yeah. handed over to local authorities and then for it to be at the at discretion of the local authority which part of these powers and to what degree they implement mm. them I, I and think, uh, additionally, yeah. uh, additionally there's uh, levies have been introduced uh, yeah. around around as well around the world um one idea that I'm um, quite keen on was saying that a spare room can always be let, can be right. let 365 days a year. Yeah. Then we have to then we have to know that it is a spare room. There is somebody living there. I don't right. have any problem with with accommodation being being fully utilised. Mm -hmm. The problem comes when accommodation is utilised for two months a year. And makes a for makes a small fortune, and then left empty for ten months a year. So I think that, and as as a compromise, if I had to make up policy on the fly, not that I'm in any position to do so, of course, but if I had to make up policy, perhaps spare rooms let indefinitely three hundred and sixty five yep. days a year, and then for whole apartments or for whole houses, you put a limit onto that for let's say sixty days per year. And then by removing a large part of the financial incentive, mm -hmm. then naturally the operations will would start to be scaled back. And we could actually see a return of legitimate bed and breakfasts. And we mm -hmm. could see a resurgence in, of, of hotels as well. Hotels right. which have provided relatively secure um, employment. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and revenues that are generated locally, mm. spent locally, and reinvested locally, not shipped off the island first of all, and mm. then even all the way to San Francisco after that. Well, I don't know if you've ever booked Airbnb, but their, their fee mm. is quite eye-watering, and that okay. goes straight out of this country. Mm. So from a local economy's point of view, it might be better to have more sort of local ways of uh, rewarding landlords for making their properties available, but also incentivizing uh, renting out to the local people, many of whom are actually needed to support the local economy, including the tourist economy. Uh, yes, um, absolutely. Uh, there, there, there are numerous, there are numerous levers that can be pulled. Um, I think in a, in a local context with the, specific economic situation that we have on the island, then I believe the local authority should be given a range of powers. Mm -hmm. And I believe the local authority should be able to consult fully and fairly with all the, all the different stakeholders as, as they are. And then at that point, they should be able to determine which of those levers that they, they can pull. Hmm. Yeah, because I think in London they've brought in some uh, rules under the mayor's powers uh, and the sort of London government. And uh, I suppose it depends how many of those powers get devolved from the national level to the local level uh, to enable the local authorities to actually start tackling some of these issues. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what was very disappointing for me recently was I read the draft housing strategy from the Isle of Wight Council. Mm -hmm. And there's one mention in there of second homes, mm. saying that there is one in six homes on the island of second homes. Yeah, there's ten thousand homes houses straight away, mm. and there was no mention at all of the high levels of uh, short-term holiday lets, which right. are maybe in addition to those holiday homes. Mm. 
within the strategy, it said that the council would be prepared to take every step necessary to solve the housing crisis that exists here. And it is a crisis. There's literally thousands of people on housing lists. But there was not a single mention of, of the, the, this uh, quite enormous factor, and that's the short-term market, which perhaps there was not a mention of it because it's very localised. I would mm. say it might only be West White, South White, mm. um, perhaps Benbridge and Sea View that right. has a very acute problem with, with this. Mm -hmm. Right. But actually, speaking as a Ventnor Town Councillor, there isn't a single mention of Ventnor as a town within the 79-page strategy. It's mm. a one-size-fits-all strategy, which doesn't take account of, of, of postcodes at all. Well, that's, yes, that's, that's I, I, yeah. I, I would like to see the local authority uh, speak, and there's also no mention of liaising with the MP. So mm. I would like to see the local authority using, using what power, using what ability they have to raise this question. I know Bath, York, Edinburgh, London, and towns in Cornwall have taken this to Parliament to, to lobby. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's no, no such word from the island, unfortunately, despite the housing crisis that we have here. Mm. Yes, that is unfortunate. Uh, but, you know, perhaps we can do something about that uh, with the election of more green councillors who are actually willing to tackle some of these local economy issues. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, certainly for me, living where I live, where, quite frankly, my the, the, num the number of neighbours is mm. going down and down right. and down. For, oh, for yeah. me, should I get to County Hall in May 2021, uh, mm. then it will be a priority of mine to work with the officers and start to lobby the MP and start to lobby through the local government association. Uh, to see what we can we can introduce onto the island. Like I say, the first step would be to have, to get very good data, and then mm -hmm. after that would be to have a very thorough consultation period. Because the last thing we want to do is is put legitimate people out of business. The last thing we want to do is deprive towns of their visitors. Mm -hmm. It is about finding the balance. Absolutely, we need the inward investment that comes from people buying houses to fix them up and rent them out. We have a lot of very old housing stock, most of it, which is Victorian or older, and, uh, you know, needs um, needs upkeep and needs the bringing up to modern standards of insulation, for example. So, I mean, like in yeah. my ward, for example, which is Freshwater North, we had an 18% population decline between the census in 2001 and the census in 2011. So by next year, by 2021, we'll actually get another snapshot of um, how the population is um, is changing, but uh, I mean, you wouldn't expect an eighteen percent drop in one ward, and yet this ward is one that has a lot of second homes, and it's having knock-on effects for things like um, school provision, because we have two schools that don't actually have enough pupils to be economically viable, when just a few years ago uh, they were thriving. So it's not just um, an issue for housing; it's um, uh, it's a knock-on effect for all kinds of public services. And of course, um, there's a sort of a double whammy, which is that people who can't afford housing then move their kids out of the area uh, to a place where they can afford housing. And of course, that's another couple of school places lost every time that happens. So it's a, they're actually quite wide ranging and, and uh, profound effects from these sort of small changes in the, in the housing market. We've always had rentals on the Isle of Wight. We've always had holidays, holiday homes, people coming down to visit for a weekend or a week, but yet we're seeing these unprecedented drops in population in certain areas, which indicate to me that there's something new going on. Yes, and I think a large part of that something new going on is, is the ease by which people can rent out property and make great revenue through uh, websites such, such as Airbnb. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, looking at the bigger picture, we have an uh, enormous problem with inequality in this country, and Airbnb is just is is simply turbocharging that mm. e ever more and more and more, and, and that, as you mentioned, in ways that are not necessarily obvious at, at first. Mm, absolutely. So on Saturday we've got a public meeting on this uh, very topic of housing and, and new homes um, in uh, Newport. Uh, it's at the parish centre, 
um, in uh, Town Lane, just uh, next to the bus station. And uh, I hope um, people will come along and um, hear from you about uh, what's going on in Ventnor and these uh, potential mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, I'm going to brush up on my facts and figures and have a good look through my notes, which I which I have have made. Um, I've put together a small list of legis legislative actions that yeah. other cities have done around the world. There's no reason why they can't be enacted in this country. I mean, if um, Airbnb are being clamped down upon in the very town in which they were started, San Francisco then there's absolutely no reason why we can't redress the balance in other places. Yeah, I mean, San Francisco also has a strong tourist economy, and yet they've uh, felt the need to regulate it. So yeah. uh, perhaps we need to do the same here, but also make sure that uh, people aren't too disincentivized from uh, investing in our local economy and buying property, fixing it up, and of course, employing builders and plumbers and electricians and plasterers and all those kind of building trades that we need to maintain here um, because otherwise the um, you know those skills will move off the island and those people won't be available uh, to fix up properties for the for the rest of us right so um, you know that we're not um, denying that there's a contribution to be made from tourism and, and letting we just want to make it work for everyone that's absolutely correct i mean you do make a good point if you have a little scan down through the airbnb listings you'll see that the vast majority of the places are very very well kept very mm. nice very mm. tidy mm. and there's unquestionably a contribution has been made into the local economy by having these places improved mm. uh and they certainly on the whole they look to be in better condition than the places yeah. on the long-term market so i mean and we have a specific issue though don't we which is that we can't easily uh, bring people um, into our eco local economy on a daily basis to do things like, um, you know, run the restaurants, um, you know, uh, clean the B and Bs, all of those kind of lower paid jobs. Um, we, if we um, drive too many of those people off the island, then uh, there just won't be enough people available to service that economy, and, and it will suffer compared to a place on the mainland where some they can bus in somebody from another town. Um, to uh, to perform those uh, tasks and earn some money from that tourist economy, that's not so easy when you have a stretch of water between um, you know the island and the mainland. Yeah, that, that that's that's correct. And I mean, for this particular uh, conversation we're having, that that that's a strength and, and a weakness, in fact, mm. isn't it? Um, so, whilst on the one hand, um, that's detrimental to the economy it also makes this conversation that we're having all the more important mm. so yes yet, yet another factor absolutely well um on saturday you'll be joined by um councillor neil oliver uh cows town councillor who's going to be speaking about um co-housing and also councillor joe lever from uh, newport community council who's going to speak about his experiences um as uh, you know raising a young family on the island and, and trying to find housing so uh, we hope to see you there. And um, thanks very much for chatting today. Yeah, thank you. I look forward to it.